Welcome to a special double guest episode of A Life in Film. If you enjoy this episode, please review and share this podcast. It makes a huge difference. Thank you. Star of the brilliant Yellowstone, Jefferson White talks about his new movie, God's Country, his journey on landing one of the most loved TV shows of the past decade and working with the one and only Kevin Costner. Julian Higgins, the director and writer of God's Country, talks about the process of getting it made and the decades of hard work that got into getting him to where he is today. God's Country is in UK cinemas from the 16th of September. Here's a clip. I wanted to ask you something. If I tell you, you have to promise you won't say anything. Tell me what? These guys keep coming back. Why do you think that is? Why do you care so much? Go back to sleep. Why don't you come inside? We can work it out. What's the matter? Hey, where are you going? I wonder sometimes how much you choose to be the person you are. We're here! Sometimes it feels like things never change. I promise you, they do. They have to. First up is actor Jefferson White. Hi, man. How's it going? Hey, not so bad. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I have to say, I uh, I watched your movie last night uh, with my girlfriend, and she was hiding behind the pillow the whole time. She was terrified. Um, brilliant performance. Thought it was awesome. Oh, thanks, man. I'm so glad to hear that. Thanks for watching it. Yeah, oh, it's great. it's uh, it's tense, huh? I it, it's uh, it's pretty uncanny. Like that sense of danger kind of trickles mm -hmm, throughout mm -hmm. the whole thing. Man, I think they're all so good. So I feel so lucky to have been a part of it. Oh, it's a great project. I've just been um, chatting to Julian as well. So he was telling me how it all came about and everything else. And uh, we didn't go into it. How, what was your process? How did you get involved with this project? I really lucked out on that one. It was just one of these, you know, auditions. You know, it's so funny. I mean, you know, you know how it is as an actor. You like audition for everything. And it's a miracle when you get a job, any job <laughs> at all. And it's like that much more of a miracle when it actually happens and, and turns out so well. So it was really, I met Julian in like 2019. And that movie is another one of these stories that's like, you know, Julian made a short based on the short story that the feature was then also based on years ago. So that's one of those projects that I think Julian has been cooking on for years and years and years. And I auditioned for it in maybe 2019. We ended up shooting the first half like spring 2020 got shut down by the pandemic and then finished it the following year so it was one of these also that like we just it was kind of amazing as an actor because we shot the first half of it stopped for a year and came back and shot the second half wow um, which was so fascinating for them too like to get to sort because they had edited we'd maybe shot 70 percent of the film so they had like edited and put together 70 percent of the film before we went back to go and finish it. So they could make mm. such informed decisions based on what they'd already done. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They could watch mm -hmm. their movie and go into finishing it with that understanding of what they were making, you know? Mm -hmm. It's such a fascinating and strange experience. Oh, that's good that it was actually used as a positive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it ended up, I think it ended up being a good thing, which is a little counterintuitive, but it is funny. It's one of those mm. things too, where like, there's some scenes where, you know, Tandy Way walks through a door and on one side of the door, it's 2019 and on the other side of the door, it's 2021. You know what I mean? There's a couple wow. of those like really strange, like, you know, in scenes that are continuous, they were shot 14 months apart. That's crazy. I could not tell it. Well, you know, sometimes if you see if even if films had pickups, you watch yeah, it and yeah. you go... Some, like someone's changed weight <laughs> a little bit their hair's dark or something yeah. not quite, but i did not see that at all with this i, I gained really 40 pounds i weighed 40 pounds more <laughs> in the middle of it's so funny from one scene to the next i gained 40 pounds because it was like 
you know, it was 14 months later and I'd been trying really hard to put on weight. So there's like, <laughs> in some scenes I weigh 160 pounds and in some scenes I weigh 200 pounds, oh, but wow. I'm wearing enough layers that it's not necessarily apparent. <laughs> it's very funny. Just keep the hood up, keep the hood up. Exactly, keep the hood up, yeah, really yeah, fun. up on the neck, yeah. <laughs> it's always the thing you do notice it sometimes. I know I've done things where I've definitely like come back from a summer holiday and had to do pickups and then suddenly you're tanned and they're like trying to make you look as pale as you did before. And it's like... 100%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now this, yeah. Um, this movie, I mean, I was talking to Julian a lot about the, the way it was shot and the there's a real, as you say, that slow kind of build and the tension and the impending of like, what is going to happen here? It, it really is a film where you're kind of like this, I don't know where this is going and I'm not sure I like where it's going. Um, what was the, what was the, I mean, other than obviously the pandemic and having to shoot it so spread apart, what was the process like on this? What, what kind of process did you have? Yeah, I mean, it was really cool. It's also like, it's such a, it's a very simple movie in a lot of ways, which was a real relief. Like this is a sort of budget range and type of movie that's incredibly fun to work on as an actor because they have all the resources they need to support the creative process, but they don't have much more than that. So it strips mm -hmm. away a lot of extraneous factors, extraneous elements, and really kind of distills it down to the sort of purest, simplest kind of process, you know, like it's a relatively small set. They're working the, 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 you know, it looks like a more expensive movie than it is because the DP and camera team are so brilliant, but it, it, it leads to actually like a very simple kind of workflow, you know, rather than having like crane trucks and drones and three cameras and, you know, a hundred crew on set. It was a very sort of intimate, quiet kind of set which I think also really is in line with the narrative, right? Like these people are alone. They're in the middle mm -hmm. of the country alone in this sort of quiet, tense kind of, you know, environment together and having a sort of stripped down intimate crew and workflow really supports that kind of work, you know? Mm -hmm. You're not struggling with pretending that there's not a hundred people standing there watching you. Like it really did feel very intimate which is amazing. And then for, as an actor, like a track, a trick that I always fall into is like playing a guy like this, you know, so my character's this kind of sinister presence, but in his mind, he's not a fucking sinister presence. Like in his mind, he's, he's a guy, he's trying to go hunting, you know, he's got his own life. He's trying to like sort of live his own life. And I can't help but read a scene like, or read a script like this and be like, okay, we're the bad guys we're these like <laughs> lurking sort of ominous, you know, figures that sort of haunt her. And you have to, as an actor, let go of all that sort of directorial style of thinking, all of that judgment and sort of try to figure out how to be like, no, no, how can I just be a guy? And then let Julian, the director, let Tandy Way, let the editors, let the sound designers, let the, you know, the musicians doing the score make it scary and make mm. it ominous, you know, because sometimes I'll fall into the trap of going into a scene and being like, I'm going to be evil. I'm going <laughs> to be an evil haunting presence. And it's like, no, man, you just got, you just got to be a person and they'll take care of that later. Like what makes you evil is like her experience of you, you know, like yeah. her experience is what makes it scary and like a slow push in and some eerie music. That's what makes it <laughs> scary. You can't go in there and, put a hat on a hat on a hat by like snarling and also trying to make it evil you know oh for sure I think that's um that's interesting actually isn't it a lot of I've a couple of interviews recently people have been saying that about playing villains it's like well to the character you're not a bad guy you're just yeah. the guy wanting to do what you want to do and your character just wanted to go hunting um and as you say change the music change the camera angle and then it's a different story um, yeah, exactly. Then she's the bad guy, right? Like these guys yeah. are just trying to go hunting and she's the bad guy who keeps like obstructing them and stopping them from living their life that they've lived for 30 exactly. years, you know? Like she's the person who shows up and is this ops becomes this obstacle to them. So it's such a tricky cuz I love, you know, I love bad guys. I love it's so fun, it's so tempting to like kind of snarl and growl and like lean into that archetype we love of the like villain. 
Um, but you have to let the you have to let the other department you have to trust trust the director, trust the editor to make that happen. And you have to be the good guy in your own mind, you know, like <laughs> you have to be the sort of main character of your own story. Like we're all the main characters of our own story. We're not, you know, number seven on the call sheet in somebody <laughs> else's life. We're number one on the call sheet in our own life, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, uh, this is probably a really strange example if you've not seen it, but they did a, someone got the trailer of um, the original Karate Kid and they changed the, they basically ch edited it, changed the music and made it so that it was the other way around, that the villain was actually the good guy and that, yeah, have you seen it? A hundred percent, yeah. That, I mean, yeah. that is, that's prime example of that. You're like, wait a minute, I've been misdirected. <laughs> I've been told completely the opposite of this. I didn't yeah. think about it from the other guy's point of view. Um, and the most interesting, yeah, the most interesting story is go back and forth and you're not sure who's the villain. You're not sure who's the good guy. I think that that ambiguity I think Julian in the script and in the edit really explores that ambiguity in a fascinating way by making, you know, Yoris, Yoris Yarsky's uh, character, my brother, giving him all this pathos, you know, putting him in this church, like sort of he's going through stuff. He's got his own sort of struggle. Like I think a really good script and a really good film like dares to live in that ambiguous space until it doesn't maybe you know until it sort of until somebody crosses a terrible line i've been watching i was i was obsessed with game of thrones when it was on and the the, the prequel just premiered you know two days ago and i'm i'm already obsessed with that but thinking about those characters and how over the course of eight years you hate them you love them you hate them you love them like it's a fa that, that's the most interesting stuff, right? Mm. When it's not quite so black and white. I think uh, Julian does such an excellent job of living in the gray area, you know? 100%, 100%. I haven't actually got around to seeing um, House of Dragon yet, but I've heard it's good, which I, like everyone was kind of going, oh, I hope it's, I know. I hope it's not awful. Um, but I've heard good things, so I'm excited for it. Well, it's such an impossible task. Like, I don't envy them that task <laughs> to come to be the, see, you know, the prequel to like the most beloved, you know, TV show of the last couple decades. It's like, <laughs> what a difficult thing to do. So, and they think that, you know, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. I could say the same for Yellowstone. I'm, I am, I am hooked, man, without going oh, off about thanks, that, but man. I could talk for hours about it. But um, your character is one of my favorite characters as well. He's hilarious. Thanks, um, in man. all the right ways but uh, are you allowed to kind of talk about that at all like are, are you guys are you filming at the moment is the the next season kind of on the horizon yeah we're working on season five right now nice very good yeah yeah which is amazing it's an incredible feeling uh and that's like the, the rarest gift in the world is to get to come back over and over you know talking about the joy of god's country coming getting to leave and come back Yellowstone has been, it's such a rare privilege to get to leave and come back and leave and come back and sort of continue to work with the same people, with the same crew. Like, it's such a family at this point over the course of five years, you know, we've been mm. making the show for like five or six years now. So it's such a rare gift to get to come back to that family every summer, you know? To show the world who we are, what we do. can't believe that this is going to be season five that blows my mind i feel like i haven't seen enough for it to be on season five i know and time is flying man i feel the same way it's really like yeah it's kind of hard to believe uh but then we're all getting older it's so funny man the other the funny thing about being on ship like breck and merrill who plays tate like he's as tall as i am now i knew that kid when he was like eight years old you know what i mean it's so funny it's such a strange we're all getting older it's such a, and jimmy you know like when I started doing the show, I was 27 and now I'm, or 26 or 27, now I'm 32. Like, it really, like, it, it's a, it's such a weird thing to get to, because also what's funny too is like, not a lot of time has passed in the narrative of the show. Like mm -hmm. in the narrative of the show, I think it's been like a year has passed <laughs> and we've been making it now for like six years. So that's always a little uncanny too, being like, <laughs> okay, I'm six years older, but I think Jimmy is like eight <laughs> months older. You know? Yeah. Everyone, everyone's aging terribly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a hard life. It's a hard life. It's life. a really hard life. I mean, yeah, it yeah. is pretty hard for those characters to be fair. A lot of shit goes down. <laughs> yeah. Oh my but, God. 
I mean, that obviously being a part of a show like that and then getting to go off and do a movie like this, I mean, that's like being able to fit those two things in. Because I know we're obviously with the big uh, series like Yellowstone, you, you do, that takes up a lot of your time. So to be able to go off and do, you know, a, a smaller budget indie like this, that must be a joy. Yeah, it feels, again, just incredibly lucky. And it's so fun to work at opposite sides of the spectrum like that, you know, because Yellowstone is this is a $100 million TV show. It's like, they have all the toys, they have all the resources they have. And it's amazing, you know, Paramount obviously is so generous with uh, the creative team of the show. They give them what they want to accomplish what they want to accomplish. And Taylor Sheridan, the show's writer, is a, a genius and also like a bit of a maximalist. You know, if he says, okay, three helicopters come over the ridge, okay, a hundred wild horses <laughs> stampede down the ravine, the SUV flips in case, you know, like, he writes these huge, huge sequences and the, you know, they have the budget to accomplish it. They have this huge, massive, incredibly talented crew that is operating on a huge scale, but that leads to a very different kind of experience as an actor, you know, like it's a very fun, interesting, distinct kind of challenge to operate within that massive infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it's very different to then work on a film like God's Country that's a very sort of different level of infrastructure. You know, it's the same level of creative vision. It's the same level of artistic integrity and, you know, specificity of point of view, but with very different resources at hand. You know, it's a very different kind of story. It's a, it's a much smaller story. Um, and so it does feel really, that's where it feels like really interesting learning happens as an actor to get to go back and forth between those two extremes and to carry each lesson into the other space, you know, like how can I, especially in, in you know, season four, season five of Yellowstone, Jimmy has all this kind of quiet, for the first time, Jimmy like gets this kind of peace and quiet. He's got this burgeoning relationship with his now fiance, like this small intimate moments how can I carry the lessons of a set like God's Country to the set of Yellowstone and create this intimacy along with my scene partners as though there wasn't a hundred crew here and, you know, four <laughs> camera trucks and like <laughs> a helicopter and, uh, the, you know, the best stunt team in the world. How can we sort of carry that small set intimacy into this big set? And then how can I carry the like technical proficiency that comes from working on the big set into the little set, you know? So if you don't hit your marks on Yellowstone, like, all right, well, the drone didn't see you. Okay, the, you know, the gimbal on the camera truck over there didn't see you because you didn't hit your mark. How can I carry the technical skills from the set of Yellowstone to a film like God's Country to support the crew there? You know, it's a really interesting kind of back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the characters as well are just, they're so different and, and 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 are you saying obviously you didn't lean into the villainous and it must have been tempting to be because you know playing jimmy you're like it's a completely different ball game and in this one you you must have been like oh, i could you know i could go like full like coella de vil on this but <laughs> <laughs> yeah i try not to but it's funny you can't help it like you can't help sneering a little it's so <laughs> fun i'm sure you've experienced this like you try to be restrained you try to sort of be you try to be like okay we're gonna really <laughs> To play it simple play the simple <laughs> truth but you can't help sneering a little bit you know you can't help <laughs> i can't help you know being a little bit you know villain mode but they're all you know they're different guys but they're also like the same guy right it's like it's my character in god's country samuel is kind of like jimmy if jimmy never got that second chance you know mm -hmm. like he's a guy who doesn't have any does very little opportunity has very few choices in his life on Yellowstone, that guy, that Montana local who's struggling and has very few choices, gets plucked out by John Dutton and given the opportunity of a lifetime. In God's country, he doesn't. He has mm. one thing. He has one sort of source of peace and pride and uh, tradition, and that's hunting with his brother. And then instead of getting another opportunity, his one thing gets taken away from him. And it pushes him in a totally different direction. You know, they're not so they don't start out so different. It's the opportunities that they're presented with that are different, you know, that diverge wildly. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, the guy, you know, Samuel in God's Country is a bit of a Jimmy from Yellowstone if he never got a second chance or a third chance or a fourth mm. chance, you know, and like Jimmy keeps getting more chances <laughs> uh, and Samuel doesn't get any. He gets his chances taken away, you know, mm. he gets his opportunities taken away.
it's almost yeah as you say it's almost like it's the same character but as if those five six years that you were actually shooting went by and you know he, he didn't get the chances that he could have got and he turned into something else it's it's very interesting and i i wonder obviously what you said there the differences between the two like doing something so big and something a lot smaller what is it like when you you know when you land that big job like Yellowstone and you know you're going to be on set with someone like I'm sure you were familiar with Kevin Costner before you went on set <laughs> what that first experience of going on set and, and having like a scene with someone like that intimidating much oh yeah hugely intimidating really like he's such a presence he's been a I, I've been a fan of his since before I could like, you know, articulate that I was a fan of his, you know what I mean? He's such a sort of icon of American cinema. Like I've been watching his movies since I was a little kid, you know? Um, luckily, Jimmy is intimidated by John Dutton, you know? So luckily I can be intimidated. Mm -hmm. I don't have to pretend I'm not. Like my character is, you know, Jimmy's as intimidated by John Dutton as I am by Kevin Costner. I think the really hard thing is when you have to pretend you're not, you know, the really hard thing is to have to walk in there and be like, Oh, I don't, you know, who cares? This guy's <laughs> not a big deal. Luckily my character, like Jimmy's terrified of rip. He's terrified of John Dutton, just like I'm, you know, in awe of Cole Hauser and in awe of uh, Kevin Costner, you know? So I I'm lucky in that way. I, I get to the, the real life circumstances inform the imaginary circumstances, you know? Mm -hmm. If I may, going back to like when you started out and, and the first love of acting and going into this industry, what was the initial kind of ignition for this? What, what, what kind of drove that passion? I did my mom. So I'm from Iowa. I'm from a tiny, tiny little town in Iowa, population like 3000. And my mom is the public librarian of a nearby, even smaller town. And she would perform little puppet shows for kids at her library, like sort of free puppet shows for the like children of the tiny little town. And from when I would, from a very young age, I would sort of get involved in those and like help her with these puppet shows. And then I would start, I would perform the puppet shows with her. And that led to just like an early interest in performing. And also like, as a kid, you know, what, what is celebrated in you, you hold on to dearly, you know? So I would do these puppet shows. And my mom would be like, good job. And then I would do plays at school and people would be like, good job, you're good at this. And you just, as a kid, I just clung to that, you know, like I wasn't great at sports. I wasn't great in school. I, I, there wasn't much that I had to be proud of, but this became a thing that I was proud of, you know, like performing became a thing that I was proud of. Um, so I clung to it <laughs> and I kept doing it, you know, through high school and then into college. I went to college in Iowa. And I never thought I would do film and TV because in Iowa, like there is no film and TV, you know, it's a very rural state, middle of the country. Like there's no industry there. I thought I would do theater. That's kind of what my training was in and what my background was in, because that's what acting was. You know, if you, unless you live in New York and LA or increasingly in, you know, like Atlanta, Albuquerque, these kind of really cool burgeoning film markets um, in Iowa, there was no film and television. So I didn't think that was really possible, but then I, did a training program in Louisville, Kentucky, of all places in 2012, which ended up meaning I basically moved from Iowa to New York with nine months in Kentucky in between. Mm -hmm. um, and I came to New York in like 2013 with a bunch of my friends from that training program and just kind of lucked out, to be honest, like came here expecting to do theater. Luckily, very luckily booked a guest star on a show called The Americans, an FX show called The Americans. And didn't really realize, like, had no sense of how lucky and, like, uh, what a tremendous sort of windfall that was. <laughs> I mean, you know how it is as an actor, like, getting a job is an absolute miracle. We audition, I audition for, I, I, my, my rate of booking a job is like one in a hundred, you know, I audition for 700 things. And if I'm lucky, I get seven jobs, you know, so he showed up in New York and just kind of luckily like managed to leapfrog from one tiny little job to another, to another uh, for years. And now here I am, you know, just kind of mm. praying my luck doesn't run out for the most part, you know? I'm I'm glad you said that, you know, your, your success rate auditions isn't high because I feel, I feel like people, people lie to you and they say, Oh, you know, you're doing really well. If you get one in 13, I'm like one in 13. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. Like, you'd be incredible. Yeah. 
I was like, if you're Brad Pitt, like, yeah, exactly. It's crazy. It's really, it's, it's really like, it, it's a very, very low success rate. And you're lucky. It's an honor just to get to audition for stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. one of the very frustrating things starting out is you don't even have access to auditions, right? Like even getting to audition is a tremendous privilege because you usually need mm-hmm. agent. You need an agent. You need representatives in order to be able to audition. Like, man, there's so many, it's such a, incredibly frustrating alienating job um Mm. and yeah there's there's so much that's out of your control you know it there's so we have so little control uh, and i just feel like it's been such a miracle that i get to do this at all you know it's like such an incredibly lucky miracle um that i'm just grateful for every day it's very Mm. very very fortunate do you, I mean, obviously you, it, you've done, you've, it feels like you haven't stopped working and you've got all these amazing credits and, and you say, obviously when you were starting out, you were lucky and you got the Americans off the bat, but have there been periods where you've been struggling out of work? And as you say, like trying to get that next job, um, that, that feeling of kind of like, Oh, am I going to get that next thing? Oh, absolutely. Especially I don't know if this was your experience. Cause you, I mean, you, you I know you, you, done a ton of this yourself this is i know we're, we're we're talking about the same thing here so i wonder if this was your experience i found the most painful gap to be in between my first and second job because mm-hmm. you get your first job and you're like okay that's a miracle lightning struck i oh my god i managed to book a job and then the time between my first and second <laughs> job was this agonizing like wait a second was it just once can I only get one? <laughs> that was it. Lightning that was strike? It. Yeah, that's the feeling, you know, because you're you're hoping to see a pattern emerge. You're hoping <laughs> to see like, okay, wow, this is sustainable. There's a slow pattern emerging. This wasn't just a fluke. In between my first and second job was like agonizing, because yeah, you want to believe that you know. <laughs> so, so, the only thing about being an actor is like it's a miracle to book a job, and then you're on set for like three days. You know, on my first job, I was, it was lucky. It was a great first job. I had three days on set. That's amazing. But it's not enough, like, especially coming from a theater background. In theater, you're in rehearsal every day, and then you're performing every day. Getting three days on set is this tiny little appetizer where you're like, wow, what an exciting environment. This is so cool. I want to be right back here. But it is like, you work so hard just to get those precious few days on set. So after that, like first glimpse on my first job, like, oh my God, look at this. This is so exciting. This is exactly where I want to be. What an incredible experience. I think it was like a year until I got another job, you know, until I got my second job. And that year after having glimpsed (laughs) what was possible, that year was agonizing. Mm -hmm. It was so, uh, you know, just like, wow, was that it? You know, all I was thinking the entire time was like, was that it? Do I get three days on set? And now I uh, go back and work at the restaurant for the next, for the rest of my life, which it would be, you know, another totally fine life. Just it's, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to see behind the veil yeah, of what's 100%. possible and then go back to your old life. <laughs> That's the, that's the, I think it, that's almost the worst thing as well. That if you, if you do get, a, especially when you're starting out and it's the smaller roles, when you get that one or two days, the pressure on that and the, the least amount of lines, the worst it is. Like people seem to think that, you know, if you had the lead in a film, that's harder. But I found that whenever I've had a bigger part where I'm kind of feel like, you know, things are on my shoulders, you've got everyone around you wanting to help you and being on your side. You're the guy going in for one day no one cares and you're there struggling and and stressing out that's definitely for me i find that a lot more stressful well 100 because when you when you're the lead you get in a rhythm too Mm -hmm. when you're the lead you get to go in every day settle into it you're in a rhythm it's like it's like being a batter in baseball if you took one at bat against a major league (laughs) pitcher a year good fucking luck if you see one 90 mile an hour pitch a year good luck you know that's way harder than going up over and over again, getting your swings in, like being the lead. And it's, it's a different kind of pressure. It's, a, it's difficult in a different way. Like the endurance becomes a huge fact. I have tremendous respect for, you know, someone like Kevin who's been carrying movies and shows on his back for 40 years. It's a different kind of work. It takes an incredible endurance. It takes like a day in and day out commitment and focus. That's amazing. 
it's a different kind of challenge to come in and say one line. That's really hard. Like it's like <laughs> you get one swing, you know, you get like, it's like going up to bat in the major leagues once a year. It's incredible. Like all the pressure is distilled down to that one moment. Mm-mm. And uh, that's, that's very challenging in its own way. And I find that difficult about Yellowstone. It's like, it's a big ensemble show. I work when we're shooting, I work a day every two weeks or something. Sometimes I'll get a few days in a row, you know, if we're at a certain kind of Jimmy heavy location. And that's like an incredible gift to get a few days in a row. Cause then you can settle into a rhythm. But for the most part, you know, we're the ensemble. We pop in once a week, twice a week, if we're lucky. Um, and it's hard to get in a rhythm, you know, cause the characters are doing the same thing every day. The characters wake up every day and do the same thing. Whereas we like, <laughs> we're all over the place. We have no, we can't get into a rhythm, you know? <laughs> no, it's that, that is, yeah. It's something that I think the people that aren't actors, find that hard to kind of uh grasp that but um yeah it's definitely that is that is one of the trickiest things and i would with something like with yellowstone i mean it feels like your character is in the whole thing he's there all the time obviously that's the that's the point but um i'm 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 surprised to hear that it's that sporadic and that you actually is you know struggling to get into that rhythm that's interesting yeah i mean i'm incredibly lucky it's the best job i've ever had but let's not kid ourselves like i'm not a dud you know, like <laughs> Kevin works probably four days a week. You know, Kelly, who plays Beth, who's brilliant, works, you know, three or four days a week. Cole Hauser, Luke Grimes, the, you know, the, the sort of the leads of the show, the family, mm. they work all the time. They really carry the show on their back, you know, in and out, scene after scene. They have an incredibly rigorous workload. Us in the bunkhouse, you know, we come around and we come in and mess around a few days a week, you know, if we're lucky. And we love it. We're actors. We want to work. You know, we want to be on set. We want to be where the action is. And we're incredibly grateful when we get to. But the truth is just, you know, like, I, that's the way the show works. That's the way the world works. Like, uh, mm. you, you, you express tremendous gratitude for the days you get. And it's also the, you know, even, you know, so God's country, right? That's, a, that's something else I felt incredibly lucky to work on. Tremendous gift. One of my favorite creative experiences. I think I shot like five days on set. You know, I think I was on set for five days. Yeah, which is like, and it's I'm incredibly lucky for those five Mm. days. But that's just the rhythm of these things. Tandy Way probably shot, you know, I don't know, 40 days or something. Mm. I shot five or six days. And those five or six days are, you know, bliss. It's perfect. It's amazing. Oh, my God. To be on set surrounded by this incredible team of collaborators, these brilliant actors, this brilliant crew. Those days, you're so lucky. Every day you get on set as an actor is such a gift. Um, And a a big part of your job is just not going crazy the other 300 days a year. (laughs) You know, (laughs) like I'm I'm incredibly lucky. I feel like, you know, I'm at a great point. I feel very lucky to be able to work on stuff like Yellowstone, work on other stuff like God's Country. A big part of this job is like taking care of yourself, building some structure for yourself, mm-hmm. figuring out what you do with the uh, other 300 days in the year. That's my experience. Is that your experience? Like, what do you do the, the rest of the time? Well, you know, the, 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 uh, the reason I started this podcast was to stop myself from going insane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So anything like that, I mean, it, it, it is kind of like, you know, choosing your hobbies. And, and as you say, it's like being on a job, getting into a rhythm when you're not on that job finding things that will keep you sane. And for anyone that's listening to this, like, you know, young actors, writers, directors, people trying to get into the industry, that is something that you have to prepare for, the, the downtime and the, and how that will affect you. But having a kind of, not a schedule in your mind, but something that keeps you kind of like, you've got, you've got some sort of structure to your life. That really helps me. I don't know about you. Oh, 100%, because it's mostly downtime. Mm-hmm. Like you can have a long, cool career and your career is still going to be mostly downtime. Like my favorite actors are interesting character actors, like sort of cool, cool actors who go and work on projects, pop up here and there, do really juicy scenes. Those guys are still working if they're lucky, you know, out 60 days a year, 80 days a year, maybe they're on set. Mm. It's like the, the, the lifestyle is mostly downtime, you know? Unless you're Kevin Costner, unless you're, you know, Adam Driver and you're working, like, <laughs> you're shooting like three movies a day, seemingly. Like, I, like these guys, 
for for one percent of the one percent of the one percent, it's a full time job, and for you know, I think for everybody else, you're lucky if you're on set. 30, 40 days a year. You know, that that's my experience and my perception. And I, from speaking with actors who have been sort of mentors to me, people I've learned from over the years, that's a big part of the lifestyle. You know, a big part of the lifestyle is what you're doing the rest of the time to take mm -hmm. care of yourself, to stay creative, to sort of have a whole life such that when you step on set, you can be grateful for the time you have and, um, and you know, deliver. Do you know Jason Fleming? Do you know the actor? Yeah, Jason yeah. I've, I've actually had him on here. He's, oh he's a, God. such a funny guy. He is incredible. He's one of my favorite. I think he's an amazing actor. He's, he's also, I worked with him on a job early in my career, and he was such a formative figure for me trying to navigate exactly this question, right? So, like, he's based in London. I was based in New York, and we were working on a job in LA, you know? So, we're both far from home. We're both sort of living in hotels. And I really looked to him. He was a really helpful sort of mentor in terms of just how to live a life, like how to navigate everything except being on set. I also mm -hmm. learned a lot from him about how to be on set, how to conduct yourself, how to sort of be a positive presence and a, you know, mm -hmm. take care of yourself and everybody else on set. But he also just taught me so much about like how to live life as an actor offset you know he was a really incredible i i really am grateful for him every day uh because he he taught me so much about just like how to it's a fucking weird life it's a very weird lifestyle you know mm. he's he's an absolute he's someone that he feels like he's been around forever but he's not even it doesn't feel like he's old enough to have been but he's been in so many films yeah. it's crazy well and he's uh, looked the same way for 30 years you know he's looked at, yeah. he's looked exactly the same yeah, for 30 yeah. years <laughs> He's um I'll have to try I'll I'll try and send it to you but the there's a clip from the episode he came on on here and he was telling a story about Sean Connery on um the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and I won't tell you it now because I'll ruin it but the way he told the story had me in stitches it was so funny I was, my basically my lead in was like what was it like working with Sean Connery and then he <laughs> told me this story and it was just not what I was expecting at all he's hilarious <laughs> he's got the best stories he's a really incredible yeah he's he's an incredible guy he's worked all over the world with the best actors in the world he's he's amazing in mm. talking of stories i mean actually this is this is how the the, the actual story of Sean Connery came about was uh, i asked him what his most embarrassing moment on set was and now I feel like I need to do the same with you. <laughs> um, so no pressure seen... at all now. You've, yeah, got, yeah. you've got to outdo him. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. No chance. No chance. Nobody's got better stories than Fleming. Um, have you seen Yellowstone season four? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a sequence in Yellowstone season four that's set up as this big joke where Jimmy has to collect semen from a <laughs> from a horse. Right. Like it's a big part of veterinary science. It's big business in the horse world is like horse breeding, you know, getting the best semen from the best horses to like propagate all over the country. And we're at a real, you know, horse training and breeding facility in Texas. The four sixes is a real place. It's one of the oldest cattle ranches and like horse breeding and training facilities in the country. It's a legendary place. We're there and we're setting up to do this uh, semen collection sequence. And then, uh, you know, it's very they're explaining it to me. They're sort of walking me through it, showing me, but it's all theoretical. You know, they're kind of showing me in space where I'll hold the sort of artificial vagina such that the horse will think that it's having sex with the, you know, female horse. Um, there's a lot going on here. And then it's like, okay, we're going to shoot it. Here we go. We're going to shoot it. And we shoot it. We, we go through and do it. You know, it's all in a one. It's in a sort of handheld wide shot. We shoot it, it goes okay, it doesn't go great. There's a moment when I sort of grab the horse's penis and try to guide it into the artificial vagina and kind of miss a little bit. So then I have to go back and like grab the penis again and sort of guide it more specifically into the artificial vagina. It all happens, they call cut. And then I'm in the position of like, this is an important scene for Jimmy. Everybody's kind of laughing, ha 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 ha, what a funny joke. But I'm in the position of being like, guys, can we please go again? I messed that one up. We need to go again. 
So all of a sudden I'm in the position of like basically asking over and over again, if I can jerk off another horse, just being like, guys, please come on. I biffed that one. Give me one more. I just need to jerk off one more horse for like 10 minutes. I was trying to convince Taylor to like, can we do one more? Can we do one more? And then at a certain point caught myself realizing that, you know, I was basically all I was doing was like asking this room full of people, all of whom were laughing at me, if I could jerk off one more horse, you know, it was like, I was just so, so bring in the next in the horse, moment. bring him yeah, in. Exactly. I kept being like, there's gotta be, there's gotta be another horse. Can we please do it again? And they're like, no, we got the shot, dude, relax. It's fine. We got it. And I'm like, no, I messed it up a little bit. Just let me get one more. Let me go one more. Better way to finish the episode on, I think that's the greatest point we can <laughs> finish it on to be honest yeah <laughs> me just me on set in the middle of texas just begging uh begging for Brilliant. one more shot <laughs> Brilliant, jefferson so thank you so much for coming on here i really appreciate it i know you're filming at the moment so you you've managed to fit us in so i really i really appreciate it man it's such a pleasure man thank you so much thanks for watching all that stuff that really means the world that's so, oh, so mate, generous I'm, of you and I'm, I'm so excited to get to know fan. your work i'm really excited to to get to know your work after this uh, so thank, thank you. you thank you thank so you. much man all right, mate. Take care. Thank you very much. Cheers, bro. Have a good Cheers. one. Our second guest is director Julian Higgins. Awesome. Julian, how's it going? How's everything with the film? I, I watched it uh, I watched it last night, in fact. Oh. And it, it's one of those movies where it just draws you in and you slowly feel this kind of impending doom and, and kind of wonder where the characters are going to go. Really enjoyed it. How, how, how did this project come about? Well, it's interesting because I, I read, it's based on a short story called Winter Light by James Lee Burke, who's a very well-known mystery and thriller writer. And um, I read the short story uh, like 12 years ago. <laughs> and it was one of those things that I've read in my life that made me, like it, it immediately grabbed me and I immediately knew I had to do something with it. And it was not something I understood necessarily why, it was something that spoke to me immediately. And I made a short film of it because it's a very short, it's maybe 15 page story. Uh, I made a short film of it because that seemed like the appropriate way to adapt it. And that was in 2014. And mm. I actually really thought that was going to be all I did with the story. Um, it was a very straightforward adaptation, actually. Uh, and then um, several years went by. And after the 2016 election, uh, I, <laughs> I felt like the story came back to me uh in a new way the the theme of it for me is like this sort of uh internal struggle that occurs when your sort of belief system and the reality of the world collide you know and that's what it felt that's what i was filled with at that time was like a sense that the norms and the expectations had not panned out and I, my writing partner shay was in the same place at that time and we sort of I told him about the story and we just kind of jumped into it. And of course we made a lot of changes to the story, but that's really how we arrived at this particular take. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, that, that's amazing. I had no idea that, that it was from a, originally from a short and, and for it to be so short, the, yeah. the way that you, the way that you shot this, um, I, I'm sure you and your cin cinematographer worked very closely together to get a certain feel. Um, mm -hmm. But there was a real, and I know, I'm not aware this isn't a horror, but it kind of felt verging on that. You know, you got the slow yeah. pans, the, 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 even the first, one of the first shots where the camera turns all the way around in the car, there were things like that where I was like, what's, mm. what, and you're looking out for things when the camera's moving slowly like that. I mean, obviously a deliberate choice, um, but where did that, I mean, was it something that you guys came up together with that look? Well, I really appreciate you noticing that. Um... So it, the, the question of the genre of the movie has been like a real, like, you know, contest of wills <laughs> across this <laughs> whole process, because as we were writing it, we really thought of it as a Western, like structurally and in terms of the character types, you know, it's it, we designed it as a Western and re the Western genre was our reference. But then as I started thinking about making it, um, it, it definitely like the feeling of watching it, I sort of intended to feel more like a thriller. So we started calling it a Western thriller. And then when we were in prep um, in Montana, where we shot the movie, I realized that, you know, the way I actually felt about it as a human being and felt about the story of this character and, you know, the experience that I was hoping to convey to the audience was actually a more horror experience, even though it's not a horror movie. You know what I mean? Like, 
it, when people when you say horror movie you're not thinking of this film <laughs> but mm-hmm. a lot of the intention of like how so the cinematographer Andrew Wheeler and I have been working together uh, again since 2009 so we've kind of figured out a way that we talk to each other at this point and a lot of my thinking about it was how to express what is a horror story for this character you know like the sort of it's it's social horror and it's sort of um it's it's trying to bring the audience into that experience you were saying a sort of sense of dread and like make her under make the audience understand what's going on with her you know so that's really thank you for noticing that (laughs) no I I love I uh, love that and um it was something where you know I I said to my girlfriend do you want to watch this movie it looks great so she sat down and watched it with me and um literally her worst nightmare is essentially the film's mm. concept without giving away for the audience but she was she was watching it behind a pillow so you know yeah. for a thriller to have that effect on someone um it really is the way it was shot it was that slow meandering sort of dread yeah the whole project of the movie because that that sense of dread and eventually horror and the sort of psychology of of what's happening to and within this this uh this woman uh, that is the project of the movie is to make you, the audience, no matter who you are, understand that and feel compelled by that and, and identify with her, you know? And um, so what I've, I've been very encouraged by is that, you know, we don't often see, uh, you know, 40 something black woman in the lead uh, in, in a Western, you know? Uh, but what's really gratifying to me is that people of all colors and genders that really like identify with this character. That's been really cool to see. Oh, Tandy Newton's character is, I mean, it's kind of, uh, it's one of those roles I can imagine as an actress would be like a dream role. Mm. Uh, how, how did the casting of Tandy Newton come about? Mm. Um, so, you know, when you set out to make your first feature and it's like a small, you know, indie film, you certainly don't expect to, you know, have the film star someone of her caliber. Uh, and, you know, of course, I mean, I've been a fan of hers forever um and you know like she's you know she's got she's just created all these indelible roles throughout her career and it just like it's funny because like you just don't dream of such a thing happening in your movie uh and what 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 actually happened was um you know I wrote her a letter um because this is the shot you have to take as a director um I wrote her a one page, very passionate (laughs) letter explaining why I thought she was right for it. Um, And, you know, through her representatives that made its way to her, she read the script and, you know, we had a conversation in which she was selling me on her being in it, you know, like she had identified, she had identified with the script when she read it and she, you know, Shay and I, Shay Obana, my writing partner, we we had sort of developed over the several years of working on the script, a kind of secret language, like how we talk to each other about the script, you know, and when she was on that first phone call with me, she was already using our secret language, you know, she knew, she had, she had really understood what was in the script and what we were trying to do, and she was telling me that, you know, she was the one, she, she wanted to be the actress who, you know, told this story, and like, that was just, um, you know, you say yes to something like that, uh, obviously, like, and I still to this day can't, um, there's no one I would rather have in the role. I mean, it, it is, it is uh, an incredible piece of work from her. You know, I know I'm biased. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. She's, she's absolutely brilliant in this film. It's quite a um, understated yet surprising performance, I think. Um, and something that, yeah, it's not something I've seen her do before. And um, it's just a very still performance, something that is subtle but you're very effective. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, that, think... that the stillness of it is also part of the psychological horror of it all, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's how we invite the audience into the movie is, you know, you have to do a lot of the filling in, you know, we're withholding a lot of information in the movie and, you know, the stillness of the performances is part of that. It, it draws you into a place where you have to pay close attention. At least that was the, that was our, that was our purpose there. No, a hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm intrigued. I obviously don't want to give away for anyone um, that hasn't seen the film, um, but the ending is, you know, <laughs> I don't know how to talk about it without giving it away, but um, it's not where I thought it was going to go. Was that always the intention? Did you always have that that kind of end mark in sight? Um, not always. And the story, the short story does not end that way. 
um, that, you know, th there's a lot of changes to the short story. I would encourage people to go, who are interested in the movie to go read the short story because it's, it's a fascinating <laughs> adaptation study. Uh, but the, um, the ending, yeah, we, we should not, we should definitely not spoil it, but the ending was something that occurred to us in the writing process after we had tried a number of other endings. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as we were thinking about the themes of the story, uh, the endings we were coming up with felt convenient to us. They were almost like keeping us safe from the truth of the story. You know, we really had to kind of keep on the, um, on the search to, you know, convey what we were feeling and the dynamics we were seeing. And, you know, it, it, we conceived the movie as a kind of like classic tragedy, you know, like a sort of epic tragedy. Uh, and that ending is certainly part of it, but I do think there's some catharsis in it as well. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what else I should say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's difficult because you can't really, um, it's hard to talk in detail about it without obviously yeah. giving it away, but yeah. We'll, we'll move on from that. I mean, so it says right there on the poster, the final shot will stop your heart. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, the final shot was uh, again, I can't really say what happens, but that shot reminded me a little bit of the Long Good Friday, um, Call Me By Your Name, like that that mm -hmm. moment where you just kind of look into the, the character's eyes mm -hmm. and uh, you're trying to figure out what they're thinking. What I can say about it is like, we want, we wanted to, throughout the movie, we wanted to be with our character, Sandra. You know, we wanted to be, we wanted the audience, we wanted to do everything we could for the audience to be with her in her emotional experience and understanding why and how she's doing the things she's doing. And so it's very, it was very important. Like some of the things we choose to show and not show, you know, are related to where we want to place the emphasis, you know, as storytellers. And so the part you're talking about, yeah, I mean, you know, you have to, you have to be there with her for a bit and like, yeah experience what she's experiencing and think about it I think we you know ultimately that's really the thing is we thought it was better to ask the questions than to provide our answers and that's kind of like something that bugs me about movies I watch sometimes where it's like you're raising all the biggest questions about life but then it's like okay I don't I want to think about that like I want to be the one contemplating the questions you've raised and so we really tried to make a movie that would challenge the audience in a way that was interesting and entertaining for them no, it was, it was refreshing to see a film that leads you down a road where you're really not sure what's going to happen. All mm. these characters feel expendable. They feel like they could die at any point. Anything could happen. <laughs> um, but I really enjoy that, that kind of edge you see kind of not knowing. And I think that's mm. quite, it's quite hard these days to go and see a movie that really has you on your toes. And this did. Um, in terms Thank of, you, you know, being uh, all good, man. In terms of being... Um, a young writer and obviously directing and and having a project like this which you've you've written and you've directed how i i mean just for because we have a lot of young writers that, um that listen to this podcast um with something like this i mean obviously you said you wrote a um, letter to sandy newton and and it worked out but what is your process if you if you've got a project like this i mean that's one way of doing it but how do you usually go about, you know, if you've written a script and then going off and trying to get it made just from basically from the start, what is that process like from writing it to trying to get something made? Yeah, I mean, I, I really feel like you first have to uh, follow your instincts about what you're passionate about, because there's a lot of things you could design as a young filmmaker that you think might fit the marketplace or like, you know, serve a purpose or be familiar or whatever. I think you have to focus on the thing that gets you personally motivated. We all have themes of our lives that we're constantly struggling with that we're con that are going to show up in our work, whether we do it intentionally or not. So my argument is do it intentionally. <laughs> like the stuff that you're struggling with in life, put that into a movie. That's how artists work through their, their, you know, their stuff and figure out who they are. So once you have that, then I think you have to decide that you're going to do it first and then figure out how because like everything else it's it's a creative problem that you have to solve like there is a way I think it's it's hard to go straight for a feature if you haven't done some shorts first not because of like the marketplace but because you have a lot to learn like I'm so happy <laughs> that I didn't make a feature you know earlier like I did a whole bunch of shorts over a couple decades you know mm -hmm. like from high school on you know I had I had and I, you know, I'd done, so I'm very fortunate to do some television as well. All those like reps 
really help when it comes to the thing like when you're finally making the project that really represents you and what you want to put out in the world as an artist you want to have learned a lot of hard lessons before then you know mm -hmm. so I think like this like focusing on the things that make you passionate deciding you're going to do it and then just creatively figuring out how you're going to do it uh and you know and just keep that going go through the process as many times as you possibly can I, I at whatever scale you can manage you know I really think a lot about what is actually in my control and it's not that much, you know, <laughs> uh, the things that are in my control is I choose what I'm going to generate and try to make. And then when I have something, I want to make sure as many people see it as possible. And then I just try to do it all over again. You know, mm. that's kind of what it boils down to. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, everyone trying to sort of climb that ladder. It's, I guess it's that perseverance, isn't it? Just trying what works and, and yeah. seeing kind of what breaks through. Yeah, because I think people say this thing like, um, you know, treat every movie you make as if it's the last one. I kind of, I get what, I get why they're saying that, but I actually feel like you have to see it as a journey that you're on. Like it's not the last one, you know, you're trying stuff and it's, I would much rather have it be a big swing that doesn't connect than like trying to play it safe or like serve some idea you might have of like what people want, you know? Like if you look at all your favorite filmmakers, they're always doing something earlier in their early in their career that is very strange that no one will get behind. It's only afterwards that when that really works and says something true to the people, it's only afterwards people go, oh yes, we knew it all along, you know? <laughs> so very like Christopher true. Nolan made following first. Now he's making, you know, Oppenheimer, so. Mm -hmm. so with um I, I mean i feel like there was a lot of i was watching this film and i was thinking there's there's a lot of films you can reference it to but what were your did you have any particular films that you kind of watched before this that you yeah. allowed yourself to kind of be influenced by yeah and they're, they're they're a little like you know um offbeat uh like a big a big reference for us was the film fox catcher uh bennett miller's oh, film yeah. brilliant um, film yeah, with, which has, you know, Steve Carell, Mark Ruffalo and Channing Tatum's best work, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an incredible movie, but it's it's also like, you know, it's it's a genre movie. It's a sports movie, ostensibly. Mm -hmm. But really what's carried inside of it is this like savage critique of American masculinity and success and like the sort of toxic uh, combination of the two, you know. And I, I really like that idea of like thinking about some of these existential political questions inside a genre piece you know like that's what I that's what we try to do with this so that was a huge reference for us and then there's this wonderful movie called Lady Macbeth which was a Scottish mm. independent film that um you know I I had seen it and it really stuck with me and I showed it to Shay it was the first reference we watched together and because it's really it's really a study of a very complex you know woman who does things which are you know, potentially uh, very questionable, <laughs> but you're with her the whole time. And it really challenges you with like to understand her, you know, and to, you know, sympathize with her. And when we got to the end of it, Shay was like, oh, I see, you know, and that was like a really good launching point for us. Those are a couple of movies that come to mind. Oh, definitely. I can, I can see that now. But I mean, Foxcatcher is, it's one of those films that even though it was nominated for a load of awards when it was released, I think it's hugely underrated. Yeah. Um, and some really surprisingly uh, surprising um, performances from people that you think kind of primarily as comedy um, doing yeah. their, as you say, their best work. You're, you're, just, you're so right. It, it like, this is getting back to the question for your young listeners and your, mm. your emerging filmmakers is, um, you know, sometimes the, the, the work that is getting to the heart of the issue isn't celebrated at that moment, you know, but it becomes more and more important as time goes on because it's accessing something deeper than just topicality. You know what I mean? Like it's, that movie is about really fundamental things about America. And it's thinking about them in a very dramatized way. It's not preachy at all. It's just dramatizing those dynamics. And when you look at it, you see some, I mean, I look at it and I see something that feels so deeply true. And yet I can't quite tell you how I know that, you know? I love that mm -hmm. experience. And hugely entertaining at the same time. <laughs> which Incredibly can be sometimes that's unusual yeah compelling characters like you're really wondering what's going to happen in all the different storylines mm. and uh yeah I mean that was a big reference for us for sure another kind of tragic story 
Mm-hmm. I would love to know how how did this for you know getting into writing and directing which was the first love and and how did that come about it was definitely directing for me was the first love uh the first love I will say I was very interested as a kid in drawing that was my first creative instinct uh, that was sort of visual arts I was the kid who drew when I was growing up you know and then at some point I you know, it doesn't maybe logically make sense, but from drawing to acting was the jump that I made. Like, I, I think I just had a, an imagination that was running wild. And it's, at a certain point, I wanted to be in the story and not just draw it, you know. Uh, and so I, I really pursued acting pretty hard all, all through my young life. I never um, did it professionally or anything like that, but I'm still a total geek about acting. Like, I love working with actors I love knowing about acting I audit acting classes like I really I'm just I love the process and I miss doing it a lot I'm so happy I don't want to be an actor anymore but <laughs> acting, acting was really the thing that got me into filmmaking because at a certain point if you're you know a kid who loves to act like you want to see how you how your acting looks you know and so in middle school some friends and I picked up a camera and started filming like scenes that we had written and that and you know really that was it like it was so clear to me when I had the camera and had to figure out where the camera would be placed to tell the story, that was, that's the challenge. That's the ultimate puzzle that I love to solve. <laughs> like, how do we turn this idea into a camera in a place, actors in space, like color palette and all this, all the stuff that goes into it, all these choices you get to make, it just continues to be incredibly exciting decades later for me, so. It, it, for for actors out there as well it must be uh, I would imagine it must be great to have a director that not only has written the project is directing it but someone that has a background and a knowledge of acting because then there's that connection there where they they kind of understand how, what it's to be in their shoes mm-hmm. um I find that I'm, I'm an actor myself and I find mm-hmm. that if you've got that connection um it's it's kind of you you can have a conversation without it's almost like a first hand Working with the cast, um, what 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 is that process for you? Do you do you, are you one of these uh, directors that likes to kind of you know let them do what they want to do and then critique as they go along, or what was your process? Well, I I mean my directing first of all love Jefferson. What a what a gent. I'm so, you're you're very. I'm, I can't wait to listen to your uh, your interview with him. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, as far as directing and acting, I think they are actually fundamentally they work in their very similar processes in the sense that a lot of work gets done, you know, in advance, like an actor will learn their lines and like learn an accent or, you know, figure out the costume, like picking the shoes, like all the things that actors do to figure out who their character is. Directors do a hell of a lot of work, but on the day, our job is to be fully present and actually looking at what's happening and responding to what's happening right now. You know, that's a, that's a, real evolution uh, from how I was taught directing. Uh, Because a lot of times, you know, people think of directors as planning everything out in advance and then executing that. And there are certainly directors who do that. My my approach is very much organized around what the actors are gonna be doing. And I want to make sure that I'm fully embracing what is being delivered to me by the actors on the day. It's not to say that, you know, I let the actors do whatever they want. I mean, I know what the point of the scene is, But I want everyone, not just the actors, but literally everyone who's involved in the project, I want all their ideas. And, you know, Mm. people say that, but like, it's it's one thing to um, kind of pay lip service to collaboration and another to really embrace what everyone's bringing to the table from their, you know, lived experiences and their perspectives. I mean, it's all valuable. To me, there's so much opportunity as a director to get better than what I had in mind, you know? What I want is actually a process. It's not the result, you know? I'm, mm-hmm. I'm a very big believer that if you take care of the process, uh, you will be happy with the result, you know? And, we're, and I'm so proud of the work that people have done on this project. I, I mean, I, I do feel like it was a project that changed su- substantially because of the little things that people were bringing to the table, you know? Julian, thank you. This has been great. We Unfortunately, we've only got time for one more question. So just very quickly, I was going to ask, um, you have, I have a choice actually of two questions because I wanted to ask both. I can't, I was going to ask you, uh, what's up next? Have you got, are you writing something that you can, you can kind of talk about? And a traditional question of mine is most humiliating moment on set, if you've got one of them. So you can choose whichever you want to go for. You're probably going wow. to go for the easier. <laughs> those, are, those are both great questions. Most humiliating moment on set is such a good question. 
um, you know, oh boy. I mean, I, I am one of those people that like, it's, it is terrifying to me to, like I was, I, I immediately thought when you asked that question of a time that I was late to my own set as the director, which is just a, like an unforgivable crime, you know? Uh, that's what, cause I was the most humiliated I've been. Uh, I had, I basically couldn't find my keys and I was ransacking the house trying to find my, the keys to my car to go to set. And I could not, this was not on this film. This was so long years ago, but uh, I couldn't find my keys. And I realized way too late that I should just call an Uber. So I did that. But, and then I came home later and found the keys on top of my refrigerator, which I have no idea why they were there. That is a very uh, random place. To it was just, it was just, it's awful. Like thinking about it now, because like I was told by a mentor of mine, Greg Atanas, who, you know, is executive producing and directing House of the Dragon now, you know, like uh, I was told by him that he had driven into oncoming traffic and through a red light to avoid being late to set, you know, like that's how important it is for directors not do not try that at home. Um, but yeah, so that was, that's really humiliating to me. The interesting thing about that story is that when I showed up to set, uh, there was another actor who was even more late than I was. So I was saved by the bell. Oh, wow. But still, that was, that. you, you know, I, I now show up to set like hours early because I'm so paranoid about, you know, <laughs> that happening again. And I am working on something else. I, I appreciate you asking. I'm, I have a project that is very dear to my heart that I've thought about for years, which I'm fine. Again, like just deciding you're going to try to make something happen if you're passionate about it. I have no idea what will happen, but I am working on it. So brilliant, Julian. I'm, I look forward to it. I've really enjoyed this. So I'll, I'll be looking out for the next one. Thank, Thank you, you so very much, much mate. And all the best with the movie. Thank you so much. Really great to talk to you. Thank you to our guests, Julian and Jefferson. And thank you to 42 West. God's Country is out on the 16th of September. If you enjoy this episode, please review and share this podcast. It makes a huge difference. Thank you. It's a life of and you better come back next month to a life and fail. To a life